This is George Kennan. He was a young American diplomat stationed in Moscow in 1946 when he sent this telegram to his superiors at the State Department in Washington. He was responding to questions they had sent him, questions about Soviet values, Soviet viewpoints, and the Soviet vision for the post-war era. The telegram was long, 17 pages, more than 5,000 words, the longest the State Department had ever received. It has become known in the annals of American diplomacy as simply the long telegram. Why did Kennan write so much? As he explains, these are questions so intricate, so delicate, so strange to our form of thought, and so important to analysis of our international environment that I cannot compress my answers into a single brief message without yielding to what I feel would be a dangerous degree of oversimplification. In other words, Kennan knew the issues were complex and the stakes were high. He refused to dumb it down, and he was determined to avoid misunderstanding. The following year, he adapted the content of the telegram for an article titled The Sources of Soviet Conduct that he published under the pseudonym X in a journal called Foreign Affairs. Like the telegram on which it was based, the article was long and written with precision. On the basis of Kennan's material authorship of these two documents, he's widely regarded as the chief intellectual author of the US policy of containment a policy that gave rise to the Cold War, the arms race, and decades of proxy wars across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Kennan remained a public figure until his death in 2005 at the age of 101. He wrote and spoke extensively, often returning to a familiar recurrent theme. That's not what I meant. That is not what I meant. In April, I had the opportunity to deliver the preliminary results of the Columbia Sensory Trial to the SCA Symposium in Seattle. Now, I don't pretend that the stakes were as high for me as they were for George Kennan, but there were a lot of people interested in the outcomes, and there was some nuance to the message we wanted to communicate, so we tried to do that with precision, like Kennan, to avoid misunderstanding. But as I've read coverage of the presentation in social media and trade press and mainstream media, I can't help but identify just a little bit with George Kennan. So I've organized my talk today around three ideas, each of which is a variation on the theme, that's not what I meant. First, that's not exactly what I said. Second, okay, I did say that, but I'd like to provide a little more context. And third, things I didn't say but should have. I'd like to start here. These are three articles that appeared in different publications in Colombia covering the presentation. Each one of them is a little different, but they all tend to converge around a single message that goes something like this. Prestigious international panel of expert cuppers says Castillo and Katura taste the same. That's not exactly what I said. It's not exactly what the data said. The data said that Castillo and Katura were equal and different. The eight rock star cuppers who gathered twice at Intelligentsia Roasting Works in Chicago told us that Castillo and Katura were equal. 22 samples of Castillo, 22 samples of Katura, two panels, two repetitions per sample per panel, eight cuppers, hundreds of data points, and when we totaled them up and averaged them out, Castillo and Katura both scored just over 83 points. The difference between the average scores of the two varieties was three-tenths of one point, not statistically significant. In that regard, the Castillo and Katura samples in this trial were equal. Meanwhile, the six highly trained assessors who gathered twice at the Sensory Analysis Center at Kansas State University to evaluate the same samples using the WCR lexicon told us that Castillo and Katura were different. From the full complement of 108 attributes that Leo mentioned this morning, Kansas State selected 36 of those attributes based on its preliminary analysis of these samples and its past experience with Colombian coffees. What did they find? First, they found that all 36 attributes were present in both varieties. It's not that Castillo presented one set of attributes and Katura presented another. The difference that they ultimately found was one of degree. Some attributes were more intense Point of departure is a significant degree of overlap in what I would call the sensory footprints of the two coffees. These 27 attributes were more intense than Castillo than Katura. 
27 of 36, three out of every four attributes was more intense in Castillo than Keturah. You can see there it's a mix of attributes that we would consider desirable in our coffees and others that we almost certainly would not. For these nine attributes, Keturah was more intense than Castillo. Again, a mix of desirable and undesirable characteristics. Here's the thing. Most of those differences are not statistically significant. 23 of 36 were not significantly different, which means that for those 23 attributes, Castillo and Keturah kind of do taste the same. For these 13 attributes, there was a statistically significant difference between the two varieties. In an analysis of variance test that we ran on each of these results, we saw a p-value less than 0.05, which means we can say with 95% confidence that these differences are significant. And here's how they broke down across the two varieties. 10 of the 13 attributes were more intense in Castillo than Keturah, and three were more intense in Keturah than Castillo. The 83 that anchors each side of the screen tells us the coffees are equal. The attributes ascribed to each variety tells us precisely how they're different. Equal and different. That is a kind of a nuanced message, and nuance is not the strength of social media, or any media for that matter. So I was disappointed but not surprised that that message did not find its way into the coverage. But I was surprised that one aspect of the presentation did not get reflected in the coverage. I called it in Seattle the original sin of the trial's design, and it was this. The sample size was small. We started with just 25 farms, and we eliminated three of those farms due to defects in the samples. With a sample size of just 22 farms, we could not generate the kind of statistical power we had hoped. And we cannot generalize about Castillo and Couture on the basis of these results. Yet that's what a lot of the coverage did. But the point was not lost on everyone, and I know that because someone in the audience posted this tweet during the talk, and she nails it. <laughs> the point is this. The trial's results should not be regarded as a definitive validation of Castillo. They should not be regarded as a definitive indictment of Katura. They should not be regarded as definitive, period. What did I say in Seattle that needs more context? I said, coppers are terrible. Actually, I didn't say it. Tim Hill said it. He's the QC director and green buyer at Counterculture Coffee. All I did was repeat it to a room full of one of the most influential audiences in coffee, and not everyone was pleased. Trish Rothgeb, the director of Q, uh, took to Instagram and said, hey, that's a good line for getting attention, but it's a terrible line for explaining what's terrible about cuppers. And she wasn't the only one. Edgar Chambers is the director of the Sensory Analysis Center at Kansas State University that developed the WCR lexicon, and he headed the team that applied that lexicon to these samples. He introduced himself to me after the talk, and he said, thanks, great job, please don't say cuppers are terrible. A few weeks after the event, I was able to catch up with Edgar on the phone. He said, the thing is, cuppers are actually really good at grading coffees as part of the commercial function that they play for their companies. I find that they tend to assign similar scores to the same coffee over multiple repetitions, and when they're well calibrated, cuppers tend to assign similar scores to the same coffee. So at that, at grading, they're quite good. What they can't do, he said, is describe coffees. He said, well, they can do it, but they're pretty terrible at it. And he wasn't speaking maliciously, he was speaking scientifically. By way of explanation, he sent me this article, which he co-authored. It was published in the Journal of Sensory Studies, which he edits. And it compares Q grading to the kind of sensory analysis they do at Kansas State. And it showed that four Q graded cuppers evaluated 13 coffees from Wheela, and to those 13 coffees they applied 59 descriptors. But only in four cases did two cuppers agree on three of the same terms for the same coffee. The study suggests that this wild proliferation of descriptors, many of which are placed on coffee bags, may be helpful to marketing, but it's kind of a problem for research. They further suggested that the lack of precision with, with which these descriptors were applied led to confusion as to what the coffees actually tasted like, which is the whole point of tasting notes. So cuppers, good at grading, still not so good at describing coffees. What didn't I say in Seattle? Given more time, I would have introduced 10 letters to the conversation beginning with G-E-M. 
genotype or genetics, environment, management. Genotype is your coffee variety. It determines the possibility parameters for cup quality. Uh, Catimor and a geisha are not created the same, and their quality frontiers are different. Environment is the sum total of all the conditions under which our coffees are produced. Elevation, latitude, longitude, slope, soils, weather. And management is everything that happens to our coffee from the seedbed to the drying table. G by E by M is a powerful framework to explain the complex agronomic interactions between these three variables on the farm, and it helps to explain a lot of important farm-level outcomes, disease incidence, yields, efficiencies, cost of production, profitability, and cup quality. We designed the Columbia Sensory Trial to isolate the impacts of G on cup quality. When we selected samples of Castillo and Catura from farms on which both varieties were grown under identical conditions, we thought we did a pretty good job of controlling for E. When we worked with growers to ensure that they applied the same uh, practices to both varieties, we thought we did a pretty good job of controlling for M. But what we found was that G was less correlated with cup quality than E and M. That genetics explained less of the variability in cupping scores than environment and management. What that means is that Castillo and Catura from the same farm tended to taste more alike than two Castillos from different farms, or two Caturas from different farms. This is the sensory map of the 32 attributes for which the sensory uh, assessors assigned scores to the coffees, assigned intensities to the coffees. What they were able to do is for most of the coffees, they were able to map farm pairs into this map together so that most of the coffees were in discrete clusters based on similarities in their tastes across the two varieties. So here we have cluster one in the northeast quadrant here concentrated. These are Castillo and Catura samples from the same farms that tasted more alike than Castillo and Catura from different farms. Cluster two in the southeast quadrant and cluster three in the northeast quadrant where we see a concentration of the kinds of attributes we would consider to be desirable in our coffees. This is the largest group and again this shows that genetics had less of an impact, or coffee variety had less of an impact on cup quality than environment and management. If these results hold up over time, and they hold up across origins, what that suggests is that for growers choosing between Castillo and Catura, what they plant may be less important to cup quality than where they're growing their coffee and how they're managing it. The next four letters are four Ps that I think are relevant to any serious discussion of the future of Keturah, and they are preference, profile, price, and probability. Most of the cuppers involved in the Columbia Sensory Trial did not have a clear preference for one variety over the other. Only two of the eight had statistically significant preferences, and this is what preference looked like in the case of one of the cuppers, an unambiguous preference for Katura over Castillo in every sensory category but three and four cuppers did not have a preference like this. We know because of the work done at Kansas State with the WCR lexicon that the two coffees have significantly different profiles. Those differences are narrow, but significant. So let's say that you're a buyer and you're the one in four who has a clear preference for Katura over Castillo. Or let's say you're that even rarer breed that can tell the difference consistently between the profiles of the two coffees, and you prefer Katura. Do you think your customers can taste that? If they can, then your single varietal Katura lot, with that lot you're selling a sensory experience, an objective sensory experience. If they can't, you're selling a storyline. And that's fine. That storyline, the relentless pursuit of quality, the conservation of exotic and heirloom varieties that are higher quality, that is an important storyline for specialty, and it's worth something. The point is, if you are not already paying a premium price for your single variety couture lots, you'll have to probably start doing that soon. If I'm a grower and I'm looking at these results, even with all the caveats, I'm seeing no difference in the cupping scores between Castillo and Katura, and I'm seeing a narrow difference in the profiles. I'm not super excited to double down on my investment in Katura unless there's a price premium on the table. Preferably a price premium that includes a risk premium and a little something extra for what the buyer tells me is a higher quality cup of coffee. So let's say you're still with me. You have a preference, you know the profile and you prefer it, and you're willing to pay a price, and your consumers are willing to pay a price, your customers. 
And in my estimation, the fourth P complicates the calculation a little more, and that's probability. If we recall that the two coffees have a significant degree of overlap in the sensory footprints, and we recall that the Castillos and Caturas from the same farm tended to taste more alike than Castillos from different farms or Caturas from different farms, what that says is your single variety purchasing policy, Katura only, isn't the only way you can get the profile you're looking for. What it does is it increases the probability that you're going to get the profile you're looking for from any particular lot of coffee. Now how much is Katura worth to you? The final three letters are Y-E-S, and that's not an acronym, that's the word yes. And it's probably the best answer to the question, Castillo or Katura, <laughs> that was the title of the talk in Seattle. Why is yes the best answer to an either or or a yes no question? Because varietal diversification is still a really important strategy for smallholder resilience, both to mitigate production risk on the farm and to seize opportunities in a marketplace that continues to demand more and more varietal lots. On the farm, nature over time will find a way to break down the resistance that we're breeding into our cultivars. When that happens, the farmer who has built his or her farm on a broad genetic base will be more resilient than the farmer who hasn't. So just because Katura didn't get separation from Castillo, let's not trash the varietal diversification strategy. Let's not go out and plant all our farms in Castillo. What we may need to do, however, is to reevaluate our relationship with Katura. Ken Davids is the founder and editor of the Coffee Review magazine, and earlier this year, he published an article in this issue of Roast Magazine titled The Geishas and the Rest, in which he assigns varieties to different quality tiers. As the title suggests, Geisha anchors the top tier, along with Bourbons, Margo Hipes, Pacamara, SL28, and the second tier is filled with what Davids calls the traditional Latin American varieties, and that's where he places Katura. He says these coffees are solid but not spectacular, and he questions the case for varietal separation of these coffees for the marketplace. The results of the Columbia Sensory Trial suggest he may be onto something. Couture did not get reliable separation from Castillo in the trial, and when it did, it didn't blow people away. We'll hear from Tim Hill one last time. Tim starts buying coffees at 84 points. The average score he assigned to the Castillo samples was less than 84. He said, that's a coffee I don't buy. And of the Katura samples, which he gave an average score over 84 points, he said, that's a coffee I buy, barely. Growers today who heart Katura may find that they increase the frequency with which they produce higher quality lots and the likelihood of earning premiums for their lots if their varietal diversification strategy points them to varieties that David's puts in his top tier of quality. So what? You've just given me 20 minutes of your lives that you'll never get back. And if you also watch my talk in Seattle, you've given me 45 minutes. And what have I given you in return? I hope I've given you six clear messages, beginning with this one. The Columbia Sensory Trial has shown that the Castillo and Katura samples that we evaluated are equal and different. The Columbia Sensory Trial is not definitive. The biggest contribution the trial has made, other than perhaps showing that Castillo is capable of producing 90 cup coffees, may be the trial itself. A simple, elegant, fairly inexpensive research design that can and I hope will be widely replicated. I hope I've told you that cuppers aren't terrible. They still are a little bit terrible at describing coffees, apparently, but the marriage of Q and the WCR lexicon will help us to overcome that. These two complementary sensory analysis methods will help us to get a really robust and consistent picture of not just how good our coffees are, but what they actually taste like. If these results hold up across origins and over time, they suggest that for growers choosing between Castillo and Katura, what they plant may be less important than where they're planting their coffee and how they're managing it. Varietal diversification is still an important strategy for smallholder resilience. And finally, and maybe most importantly, we probably need to have a really candid conversation about incentives for quality. What is a single variety sourcing strategy worth in the marketplace, and what does it take to make it work for growers, particularly when that strategy leads growers away from resistant varieties to varieties that are susceptible 
to coffee leaf rust and other diseases. The varieties that Ken David's put in his top tier of quality don't, aren't just susceptible to rust, but they're low yielding, uh, which means in addition to a risk premium and a quality premium, there's probably got to be some kind of productivity offset in that price, and our, our specialty coffee is getting suddenly very expensive indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you.